morning, everyone. What a great start to the day. I'm just thinking about applying the techniques I've just learned. So if I get more excited and inspirational at any point during this talk, you'll know what's happening. Um, I'll just start with doing declarations of interest. Um, the research I'm going to be talking about was funded by the uh, National Institute for Health and Care Research in the UK. And I work as a, a general practitioner in the NHS, but um, no other uh, declarations of interest to make. Um, so but people always start, start talks by saying it's nice, nice to be here. And I'll say that, but it is really nice to be here. It's a very kind of special um, point in time for me because uh, 10 years ago, I came to the Preventing Overdiagnosis Conference um, in Dartmouth, um, which we've heard about already. And it was a transformative point in my career and the, the, what I'm going to be talking about today, the, the seeds of it were, were, were generated at that conference, so it's a real treat to be able to come back and talk, talk about it now. Um, so I'd like to say a big thank you to the Preventing Overdiagnosis Conference and what a friendly, welcoming, inspiring, terrific community it is, so thank you everybody. Um, and while I'm on thanks, I'd just like to make some acknowledgements about the, the work I'm about to present. It does build heavily on the work of, of, in shared decision making and communication of risk that's been going on over the last uh, 10 years or so, um, or 20 years, um, by lots of people, you know, notably uh, Lisa Swartz and Steve Woloshin, uh, Victor Montori and his team uh, in the UK, and Angela Coulter and Glyn Elwin and the International Shared Decision Making um, Collaborative and the British Medical Journal and their work with Helen MacDonald and the team from the Magic Collaborative and their Rapid Recommendations work. So I'd just like to acknowledge um, everything they've done and thank them for it. And the other agenda, why I say that, is there are quite a few of them in this room and I'm a bit worried they're going to hear this talk and go, dude, you've stolen my work. Um, so I'd just like to say it's been inspiration and not plagiarism, I hope. Um, but what I want to do today is, is make the case that it is, it's possible to reduce the harms f relating to overdiagnosis and overtreatment by things we can do in the consulting room now, today, um, despite all the, the obstacles and barriers and um, systemic forces against us. Um, whether or not those solutions are scalable and can be applied by most clinicians most of the time to most patients is a very different question, but I'd just like to um, paint a picture of what might be able to happen in the consulting room. Um, so the, the area of practice I want to talk about is long-term conditions and risk factor modification. So this is something we spend a, an awful lot of time doing as GPs. Um, blood pressure, cholesterol, osteoporosis treatments, management of diabetes, heart failure, all that stuff. Um, and I was at the session on time needed to treat yesterday, and we know that if we managed all these conditions as well as we're supposed to, we would have no time left to do anything else and not even sleep. So this is something very um, uh, sort of close to our hearts as GPs, I think. Uh, and I want to just start off by going through some really basic explainers about uh, long-term conditions and risk factors and, and treatments. And I, I apologize because lots of people in this room will know this already, but many won't. And I just wanted to get some, some basics out there before I start. So this um, picture here, if we imagine these 100 smiley faces or sad faces, these are 100 people. And let's say they've been diagnosed with high cholesterol. And they haven't just got high cholesterol, they've got a lot of other cardiovascular risk factors. Maybe they've got a strong family history, they're diabetic, they smoke, you know, whatever. And for those of you who don't practice in this area, what, what we do as, as clinicians is, is combine these risk factors, um, cholesterol or whatever, to produce uh, a, a projection of a, a cardiovascular risk score, which illustrates roughly the likelihood of that person having a heart attack or stroke or whatever over the next 10 years is the most common uh, way we model this. Um, so let's say there's someone who's had high cholesterol, they've got all their other risk factors, and we can say 100 people like you, over the next 10 years, 40 of you, who are the ones with the red faces here, are likely to have a heart attack or stroke over that time. So you've got some high cholesterol, do we want to treat that? And then the next question might be, well, what effect is treatment going to have and is it worthwhile? And this next slide illustrates that. So 
If we treat 100 people like this with a statin, 15 of them who have now got yellow colors on this uh, graph will not have a heart attack or stroke or die, one or the other, over that 10-year period. Um, the 60 green people were never going to have that anyway, so they've taken a statin for no reason. And the 25 people at the bottom took the statin but still had a heart attack or stroke or whatever. So within this picture, we can see there's some overdiagnosis. You could say, at least within a looking, thinking about a 10-year window. So these 60 people who've been told they had high cholesterol, they were never going to have the heart attack or stroke or whatever. You could stretch the definition of overdiagnosis, and I don't want to talk about this for too long, and you could say, well, the, the 25 who took the statin and still had the heart attack maybe were overtreated. Um, let's look at a, another set of 100 people. So this, these are people who've got mildly raised blood pressure. So they've had a health check, and their blood pressure is stage one hypertension, um, uh, and they've got no other cardiovascular risk factors. Otherwise, they're healthy, um, nothing else to worry about. So despite their raised blood pressure, their overall cardiovascular risk is low. So only five, five people out of the 100 would be predicted to have something bad happen over the next 10 years. If you treat those people, all 100 of them, with blood pressure drugs, maybe the evidence is uncertain and uh, a bit controversial. But let's say one out of those five people avoids a heart attack or stroke after 10 years of treatment, and you've treated 100 people. So this is the, the stuff of everyday practice, and tens of millions of people in each of our countries are taking medications on this basis. And you can see within this range of risk and range of treatment, there are very different levels of overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So here, where you have somebody at low risk with a mild risk factor, lots and lots of people are getting overdiagnosed. 95 people out of 100 did not really need to know about their hypertension, at least if we're thinking in a 10-year window. It gets more complicated because you have to think about what happens over 10 years, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and we all presumably have an opinion about what of these pictures represents good medicine, what level of risk and what le level of benefit we would think it would be worthwhile to take drugs, what do we think the healthcare system should be doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you'd think, wouldn't you, that if you went to see your doctor and you had either of these situations, your doctor would know these kind of numbers and they'd know roughly what your risk was and they'd know how effective the treatments they were offering you were going to be? Sadly, the answer is they don't. Doctors are really, really bad at knowing these numbers. We know a lot about the conditions. We understand hypertension. We know how the drugs work. We know that by prescribing, we're trying to prevent this particular uh, thing happening in the future. But we don't know how much uh, our drugs are going to help you, what the sort of number the numbers are about um, uh, these benefits. And this was my state of knowledge about 10 years ago before I was uh, enlightened by the preventing overdiagnosis literature and, and conference. And unfortunately, how we'll, most of us think and work is in sort of linear kind of narrative terms. High blood pressure puts you at risk of stroke and heart attack. Blood pressure treatment lowers that risk. It will prevent a stroke and heart attack. And that's about it. Um, there's been research, uh, a considerable amount of research uh, looking at how much physicians know uh, about and clinicians know about these numbers and absolute risk and benefits and harms of treatments. And there's this fantastic systematic review from 2017 by Tammy Hoffman and Chris Del Mar, which uh, looked at 42 studies on all kinds of doctors over the world, um, from pediatricians thinking about antibiotics for infections to um, cardiologists thinking about the effect of statins to liver transplant surgeons estimating how long liver transplants were going to last people. And across all of these, this spectrum of, of clinicians, people had a great tendency to overestimate the benefits of treatments and underestimate the harms. There hadn't been any work, there'd been very little work in GPs in, this, um, in these studies and nothing in Britain. So a few years ago, I um, did a large online survey of GPs in the UK and asked them a number of questions about common conditions that they were um, treating people for every day in their practice, so diabetes, high blood pressure, all that, and, asked, and used, gave them little clinical cases of patients and asked them to, to guess what the absolute risk reduction uh, from a particular treatment would be for, um, uh, for that patient and, and that treatment. 
I'll just show a couple of results from this. So this is a question um, which relates to that person with high blood pressure I just showed you on, on the smiley faces. This is someone with mild hypertension and um, no other cardiovascular risk factors. And on the y-axis going up, these, these are the number of GPs that gave a particular response. On the x-axis going from uh, left to right are the numbers between 1, 0 and 100 of the, the percentage absolute risk reduction that the doctors thought this treatment might be giving, or, the, or you know, what are they, what's the rough idea they're carrying around in your heads? And the correct evidence-based answer is probably something like 1%. And you can see the huge range of results that were given by the doctors. Um, and I think this really matters. Now, the reason we don't know this information is because it's really hard to find. It's not the fault of the doctors for not studying hard enough. This information is kind of hidden from everyday clinicians in, for all intents and purposes because of reasons of time and, and et cetera. But just think the kind of conversation somebody would have if they went in to talk to their doctor about their blood pressure and they thought the absolute risk reduction was 25%. The conversation is probably going to be along the lines of this might be a good idea for you versus somebody who knew the real answer who might be having a more you know, nuanced discussion about whether this was a good idea or not. And I asked people about 30 questions and all of the graphs looked pretty similar to this. Just to be fair, I'll show you that this is the best answered question in the entire survey, which is asking people to estimate the absolute risks of major bleeding when you take in anticoagulant, um, which was 2.5%. But And th that was the best answer. And you can see the results are clustering around the, the real evidence-based answer, but there's still a, a you know quite a range. Um, so I had this insight um, just before coming to, to Dartmouth and just thought, wow, if only we had access to these numbers, this would transform our practice. Instead of just following a guideline and doing what we thought was the right thing, if we really, really understood the benefits and harms of these treatments, we might be able to have much better, more nuanced conversations with our patients. Uh, we might not have the out-of-control polypharmacy that we have. Um, it might be able to practice evidence-based medicine that was really uh, intended. So all you need to do is put this information online. How hard can that be? You just put the numbers up. So here I am 10 years later, because it was that hard. Um, it was a, 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 an MSc, um, thank you to Carl and Annette from the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine for, for that uh, incredible education, uh, and, and a PhD which uh, developed uh, what I'm about to show you. So I had this idea, well, you know, we should just have a website as GPs where we can easily access this information. And that's what I'm just going to show you in the last five minutes of this, um, uh, this talk. So it was, it was really difficult. Um, and this reflects my naivety at the beginning of the whole enterprise. But there were two main, the two main pieces of work that needed to be done in creating this. One was the, the academic work of searching through the clinical evidence and, and getting the numbers and quality appraising it and all of that stuff. I'm not going to talk about that much today to, other than just to say briefly that the information on this website is mainly anchored in the evidence reviews behind nice clinical guidelines, quite often going to Cochrane reviews and sometimes other, other um, high quality evidence. And we had a process for that. But the greatest challenge was designing it. Um, what I learned along the way was how difficult it was going to be to present this information uh, to clinicians in ways they could understand. It was really interesting because I turns out I'm a slightly nerdy kind of GP and I was interested in this stuff already. But most of my colleagues are quite uh, find scientific language, uh, numerical presentation of data quite challenging and difficult, certainly unintuitive. We've all been taught it at medical school. We had our, our, you know, our courses on evidence-based practice, but that knowledge has faded. They feel a lack of confidence uh, in reading things, in understanding scientific terms. Also, um, we're very short of time. We're busy. We're stressed. Um, you've got to be able to absorb information if you're in a consultation in a few seconds. 10, 20, 30 seconds is probably all you've got. And doctors do use online information in consultation, so it is possible. But this um, key problem of presenting complex information in a simple, understandable way that was actually going to be usable was an enormous challenge. So building this was um, involved a lot of participatory co-design with uh, working with GPs and patients to, to inform the design of it. And that was iterated over um, 
uh, a couple of years with, with lots of adjustments on the way. I'm doing a talk tomorrow afternoon in the clinical solutions sessions where I'll be talking in detail about that design process if anyone's interested. Um, so I'll just quickly show you the website and I have to come out of the slideshow. Um, it's called gpevidence.org and it's online now, it's freely available. Um, if you want to go and have a look at it, make sure you're on a big screen because it doesn't work on little mobile phone screens, um, just so I don't uh, upset anybody. Um, what we've got, uh, so we started with 12 long-term conditions um, and we recognize this as bread and butter of practice, you know, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, COPD, all of that. Um, and I'll just show you the coronary heart disease section first of all. So it's, as you'll see, very simple, very minimal. There's very little discussion or, um, uh, you know, unnecessary background. Um, incidentally, at, in Dartmouth, uh, when uh, I had the seed of this idea, I, ran, I held a workshop and it was done on the last day and the scientific committee and everyone else were having their meetings, so there was nothing else on in the conference. So I had a room full of like 50, 70 very clever people from all around the world in this workshop. It was just amazing. And, and I asked that workshop, you know, what, what would something like this look like? What would an a, a ideal clinical guideline look like? And I came with this list, fantastic list of recommendations, most of which are in here. So thank you for everyone who is at that workshop. And it's nice, to, uh, I hope it's nice to see that coming to fruition. So we've got stuff about information about lifestyle interventions. Um, and uh, you have a little bit of blurb, but the main evidence communication is centered around this sort of infographic structure which the doctors really, really liked and it's, it communicated well to them. We've got the information in uh, a number of different formats because people like to understand risk in their own individual way. So we've got graphics, we've got scientific, you know, absolute risk reduction, numbers are needed to treat. There's a little pop-up box that'll explain the statistics if you're not confident about them. And we've got a plain language version of the same information. So the same information about the clinical evidence is presented in five different ways in a way that, that people can understand. And underneath we've got um, buttons about the evidence source, the evidence quality, uh, using the grade method, stuff about the study population. Um, so you can think about things like, is, is my patient like the patient in the clinical trials and all of that. Um, and the same structure applies to drugs. If we just have a quick look at beta blockers. Um, bit more blurb there because it's the beta blocker evidence is complex, a bit controversial and uncertain. Um, and so there's your evidence about beta blockers and the, you can also change things like which outcome you're interested in. Is it death, mortality, non-fatal MI and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, so do have a look around and see what you think. Um, does it work? Yes, it does. This was, I think, we this was tested probably about 40 GPs over the course of a process of co-design and a, and a brief um, summative evaluation um, using focus groups. And the doctors who are normal doctors, you know, nothing, not academics, uh, were able to find the information, understand it, and describe how they might be able to integrate it into their practice. Um, and some of them uh, made suggestions about things they might do differently. Uh, and that's a... In a, you know, there's a lot more work to be done, particularly about how this might actually be used in real practice, which is a very different uh, question to uh, what might happen in uh, a, a testing scenario. I'll stop there and um, we can talk more about that in the discussion. So thank you very much.